we'll see how big your faith is if I can finish it by 11.45-ish. That's my, my target. You can finish when you want to finish. Thank you. I actually, I appreciate that. And it's true. <laughs> and if you got to know because the game's on, you just do what you need to do. It's not until 3.30. Oh, look at that. All right. I'm cutting into my preaching time. Um, hey, we've been talking about the presence of the Lord. And, and the, our pursuit is the presence of the Lord. Here when we worship, we are being intentional in the giving instruction of how do we engage with the presence of the Lord? How do we, how do we enter into his manifest presence, his experienced, made known presence? Not just that God is everywhere, but, but how do we come away from, how do we come away from our gathering corporately and say, man, God showed up today? Like we know God's everywhere, but God showed up there. Well, how do we experience that? And then, really, we're not just after that for our Sunday morning gathering. We're after that for more than Sunday. Every, every day, as individuals, families, uh, the church as a whole, that we would learn to experience the presence of God. Not just so that it's an experience, but that I, I'm walking with the Lord. And I'm fellowshipping with Him. And I know what His heart is. And I know what He wants to do in certain situations. That manifest presence of the Lord, we're talking about living in His presence. So we've just been walking through that with an emphasis on worship and, and engaging with Him. And so again, Dane and the team, thank you so much for leading us into this time and, and calling us to press in and push and beyond what is comfortable and even maybe our previous experience. That our hearts would, would uh, engage with the Lord, but our mouths would also do it and we would lift up our voices to the Lord. That we would join, you know, the thousands of you know, millions of people all around the world in lifting up our voice to, to honor God and to worship Him. We're, we we know this is something that for us, it's where where we're, what we're pressing into. I want to keep talking about the presence of the Lord, but I also today I want to talk about um, what keeps us from the presence of the Lord. So we mentioned this and. and in Genesis chapter 3, if you recall, verse 8, Adam and Eve, this is in the very beginning, it says, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Why did they hide themselves from the presence of the Lord? Shame. What just happened before that? They were ashamed, right? They, they realized they're naked, and they were then afraid. Their, the fear came in. What led to that? They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? What is that all about? Well, it's ultimately God said, don't do it. And they did it. And when they did it, God was not saying it to, to take away their fun, but he's saying it to protect them. And as they did it, they, they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, in the day that you do it, surely dying you will die. Surely you will die. Of course, physically they didn't die, but this, there was a spiritual separation and death that they experienced, and it caused them to hide from the presence of the Lord, something that they had never done before, something that God never wanted for them. So now they are hiding from the revealed presence of the Lord. Though God is everywhere, there is a sense of separation because of sin. Sin always drives us away from the presence of God. I want you to turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 14, and this is where we're going to primarily focus today, talking about this here and what keeps us from the presence of God. God's plan is to walk and talk with us every day, to live in his presence, but sin breaks intimacy. Sin will break that. If you're experiencing a lack of intimacy with the Lord, then uh, allow God to invite you back on track, right? Because it is not his desire to be distant. It's his desire to be close. But there are things that drive us away from him. Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 1 through 11. I'm going to read all of these. You can read it from the screen or even better, read it in your Bible as I'm uh, along with me. But verse 1 says, Now some of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, these men have set up idols in their hearts and put before them that which causes them to stumble into iniquity. They set up idols, not just around their houses or around their property, but he says the idols are in their hearts. And those idols, those things on the inside of their heart have caused them to fall into iniquity. 
Should I let myself be inquired by them, uh, inquired of, uh, let me start over that sentence. Should I let myself be inquired of at all by them? Therefore speak to them and say to them, thus says the Lord God, everyone of the house of Israel who sets up his idols in his heart and puts before him what causes him to stumble into iniquity and then comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him who comes according to the multitude of his idols, that I may seize the house of Israel by their heart, because they are all estranged from me by their idols. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, repent, turn away from your idols, turn your faces away from all your abominations. For anyone of the house of Israel or of the strangers who dwell in Israel, who separates himself from me, and sets up his idols in his heart and puts before him what causes him to stumble into iniquity, then comes to a prophet, a prophet to inquire of him concerning me, I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. I will set my face against that man and make him a sign and a proverb. I will cut him off from the midst of my people. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. And if the prophet is induced to speak anything, I, the Lord, have induced that prophet, and I will stretch my hand against him and destroy him from among my people Israel, and they shall bear their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be the same as the punishment of the one who inquired, that the house of Israel may no longer stray from me, nor be profaned any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people, and I may be their God, says the Lord God. Okay, all of our messages have been really upbeat. <laughs> And then we get into this right here, talking about idols in our heart and, and God, uh, you know, bringing down judgment on, on them and, you know, this iniquity here. This is not how our messages have been flowing. Everything has been, yeah, come on, let's press in and let's uh, grab hold of the presence of the Lord. But there is something that is uh, so important for us to recognize what can keep us from that. That as much as we want to press into the presence of the Lord, we need to know what hinders us. And how is it sneaking up in our lives and keeping us divided to where, man, we hear about God, we hear about his presence, but we don't experience it. And sometimes we want to, but we don't even recognize there's something in our life. There's others whose their life, they're like on the edge. And so a message like this comes that might sound a little bit stronger than normal. And, oh, wow, we're really talking about that. And, and, and. You're focusing on that, but the reality is there are some people who might be on the very edge and making some decisions that can cost them greatly. Yep. And the Lord's saying, I want to rescue you. I want to pull you back from the edge. I, want, I don't want you to keep going further away to where your heart is so hardened or the decisions you've made uh, destroy you and the, those around you. I'm, I'm reaching out to rescue and save you before it's too late. So this is where we find ourselves with Ezekiel in the Old Testament. He's talking to him about idols. And these idols, though, we know that people worship idols out here very often, but it's idols in the heart that he's addressing. And this is the thing about worship. Worship's all about the heart. Coming into the presence of God is all about the heart. God is after your heart. He cares about what's going on in your heart. He wants, he, he's concerned about those things. And when there's idols in our heart, that causes us to be separated from the presence of the Lord. Now, think about the word idol. That when you think about it, you will often think, okay, it's this uh, image that is carved. In fact, oftentimes in the scripture, the word image is used instead of the word idol. They're, it, they're used interchangeably. So if you think about the first commandment, that I'm the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. Uh, nor shall you make any carved images. You should not make any images, right? You bow down before them. This is something that God is particular about. Who's our God? <laughs> Who's first? Who do we worship? And that's not only externally, but in the heart, the whole idea of the image. So an idol, it means an image, and idolatry is the worship of an image, Think of what image is, the root word for imagination. So if there's an idol in the heart, there's this imagination, there's this dwelling on this, focusing on there's this uh, fixation on something, there's this, um, there's, there's some other picture on the inside 
when we're talking about an idol in the heart, a picture of what, who we are, what we should be doing, what we should be going after, we fixate on these things, this idol in the heart here. So in other words, if you're thinking about something more than you're thinking about God, that might be an idol to you. Meaning this, if, if I'm thinking about my, uh, if I'm fixated on something that will provide for me more than I'm fixated on the Lord and believing Him, that might be our idol. For example, hey, if I only won the lottery, then I'd be able to, right? Anyone, if, I, if, I, if I win the lottery, then it could fix my problems. If I only had more time, then I'd be able to. Well, what is that? It, it, there's, there's all these things that promise what God promises to us, but they say, I'll take the place. If you just fixate on me, focus on me. Man, if I could only get this to happen or that could happen, sometimes those, those are our God. If I only had a better education, if I only had a better husband, if I only had you know, a better, better house, those things can become idols to us. And we fixate on, on them, and it's something that's on the inside of the heart. And so, is it possible that you have an idol in your heart? If you have an idol in your heart, this is, here's three things we're going to talk about that would be a result of having an idol in your heart. Here we go. Number one is presumption. Presumption. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 3. Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put before them that which causes them to stumble into iniquity. You put the idol in your heart and it goes before you and it leads you into iniquity. It causes you to stumble. It is, it is like what Romans uh, chapter 13 verse 14 says, make no provision to, for the flesh to fulfill its desires. When you have an idol in your heart and all of a sudden you're thinking about ways to fulfill certain desires. You start to fixate on it. You start to look at it. And whether this, you know, we can think of it as the most common, like drug use or something like that. But sometimes it could be the, the um, it could be what I'm going to tell that person when I see them. <laughs> and there's this, there's something on the inside of you that you're fixated on. And it's helping to set you up for stumbling later. You're thinking about it, you're focused on it, and it'll keep you from doing the right thing. It'll lead you into doing the wrong thing. If you find yourself fixating on things that ultimately lead you down a path to where, oh, I, I know I shouldn't be doing this, I shouldn't have done that, but I did it. Chances are there's something on the inside of your heart, and if that's a repetitive thing, there's something on the inside of your heart that has become an idol. And you've allowed something on the inside there to take the place of, of the leadership of the Lord. And that will cost you intimacy with God over and over again. In Israel, anybody ever go to Israel before? So oftentimes when you do a tour, you'll go up and you'll see all the different places. But you can go up to the northern part of Israel to where uh, Jeroboam set up um, the, the altar to the golden calves up there. And this was a place where... When the kingdom was united, then Jeroboam and Rehoboam, they it split off under their leadership, and Rehoboam listened to the wrong people, and he ended up with like the tribe of Judah and one others, and then uh, Jeroboam was leading the other ten tribes, and he was up north. So, so Jer Rehoboam was still in Jerusalem where the uh, temple was, uh, and the altar where everyone was supposed to gather for three times a year to worship, all the men were. But Jeroboam, he set up this altar up north. And he said, well, we can just worship up here. And why, why did he do that? Because it's convenient. Because it's such a long way to travel down to the southern part of Israel there. And so we don't want to make it inconvenient for people. We want to set something up so that it's now convenient for them. And not only did they make it to where it's convenient, but he also mixed other gods with that. So he set up the golden calves. And the golden calves were there, and he said, these are, the, these are the calves that brought you out of Egypt. And what happened? With the convenience of, for worship came the mixture of other gods or other idols, and they started looking, if you think about this, what brought us out of the bondage into freedom? It wasn't God, it was something else. Sometimes we have those idols, and we can set them up in our heart, and we can think that we got free on our own. We can think that we've accomplished everything because of our own strength. And we start to set up idols in our heart. He set up the God of Mammon. 
The God of mammon is the one who would say, I'll provide for you. I'll take care of you. I'll cause you to prosper. You just bow down to me. And Jesus said, you can't serve God and mammon. You can't serve God. But mammon promises convenience. Mammon promises convenience. Well, it's inconvenient to tithe. It's convenient. You can't afford it. You can't make it. If you tithe, if you, tithe you won't be able to pay your bills. And yet, that's what mammon is saying in his heart. And it comes through fear. But yet, Jesus says, you can't serve God and mammon. Right? You'll either love one and hate the other. Or you'll serve one and, and, and not the other. And so... There are these idols that, that got set up for the convenience sake there, and we do the same thing. Sometimes in our own hearts, the, idol, the, the idols cause us to have a convenient Christianity. And so we serve the Lord when it's convenient. We follow him when it's convenient. We do the things he's told us to do when it's convenient, but when it's not, we're in charge. And so, oh no, that I just I don't have the time, I don't have the ability, I don't have what it takes, I, I don't have the desire, I don't whatever. And and what's happening is there's this idol that we're wrestling with on the inside. And God's saying, but I want to break, I want to break through. I want to be your God. I want to tear down that idol. I don't want to be second. I don't want to be your convenient lover. Which leads us to the next thing, estrangement. When there's an idol. It leads to estrangement. And that's the word we don't use very often except for in the context of an estranged marriage. But when you look at Ezekiel chapter 14, you'll see it's exactly that. Ezekiel 14 verse 5 says that I may seize the house of Israel by their heart because they are all estranged from me by their idols. Estrangement is a separation. But when you think about it, the, the way the Bible describes it here, it's like a married woman who, who's, she, she's, committing adultery she's separating from her husband she's separated from her husband and there's this estrangement because though she is married here she's with another person and and god is giving this picture saying no you're you're married to me you're married to me and and when you give place to sin in your life and when that is set up in that idol in your heart it's like you're going out and you're committing adultery and then you're sliding back into bed with god and this is something that we look at and we think, that's not okay in my marriage. Is that okay in our relationship with the Lord? And so we have to hear these things and think, God, I don't want that. I don't want that. When I'm reading the verses, I'm thinking, oh, not just about, not just about when, when, when you people or those people, Lord, the times that I've done this, have, have I been the one who would sneak out, commit the spiritual adultery, and come back in and uh, try to just slide back into bed there with you as if it's okay? Lord, I don't ever want to fall into that and dishonor you that way. It causes a fear of God on the inside. That is calling us to say, to, to repent and, and to come back to him. Jeremiah 3, 6, the Lord also said to me in the days of Josiah the king, have you seen what the backsliding Israel has done? She's gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree and there played the harlot. And then verse 9 of chapter 3. So it came to pass through her casual harlotry that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. So God is talking about his people as they go and serve other gods or they have other idols in their hearts and externally as well. He's saying that she, it's like committing harlotry. That's a nice word for prostitution. Neither one of them are really nice words. But there is this adultery, but it's I'm exchanging. I'm not just uh, going for another lover, but I'm exchanging this for something else. For what those other gods would promise me or what the that moment of sin would promise me. He says, they're going up onto every high mountain and they're committing adultery with stones and trees. How do you commit adultery with stones and trees? Well, the stones are used to fashion altars. The trees are used for sacrifice, burning, you know, lighting up the, the sacrifice. And he's saying they are continually setting up these altars all around and sacrificing other, their, their life. They're sacrificing themselves to other gods. 
And I was thinking about this. When, when we think about sacrificing in life, we sacrifice something for something else. We, we know like we offer up a sacrifice of praise, right? But really, in our lives, what are we sacrificing? We're not sacrificing animals to God anymore. We sacrifice our time. We sacrifice our life. We sac you know, we're living sacrifices. All of it worth it. But you think about it in a negative sometimes. What, what else do we sacrifice things to? How are we setting up altars and, and um, making sacrifices? You think about people who, when their, their idol in their heart is um, success, affirmation, prosperity. Sometimes that shows up in their, their altar becomes their job. Their sacrifice becomes their kids. The sacrifice becomes their marriage. Their sacrifice becomes their, their relationship with the Lord. Sometimes our kids can become our idol in our hearts. And what do we do? We set up altars called, I'm going to go, be careful here. Some of you might be offended. Sports. And now I'm running my kids to every sporting event and they're not in church. And I'm wondering why they don't want to serve Jesus later on. Well, we didn't serve Jesus at home and we didn't prioritize him because we set up this altar and we sacrificed something. We sacrificed, uh, you know, our, our time with the Lord. We sacrificed our children for the sake of maybe I want to live my life vicariously through them and be successful. Or I just want to see them successful and doing well. But we put such an emphasis on that. And we sacrifice. We set up altars. And we sacrifice. By the way, do what you <laughs> do what the Lord leads you to do with your kids in sports, and, and some of them are going to be more successful than others, but don't sacrifice their relationship with the Lord for the sake of sports. 100% yeah. of people stand before the Lord. One in one million get to play professional. Let's make sure that we prepare <laughs> for that day when we stand before the Lord. Amen? Amen. Um, we, we think about these things, right? I, I, I'm after something in my heart, so therefore I set up an altar and make sacrifices for it. And so often the, the, um, the thing that gets sacrificed is our time with the Lord. The value of his presence in our life, we just throw that right on there. And because I'm after this. I'm after this, the convenience, the comfort, the promises, all these things that some of them, are, some of them actually could be good for us, but, and the Lord would give them to us. Some of those things are things that maybe, maybe we could live without just a little bit better, right? We'd be okay without them. And so what does God say in, in Jeremiah three fourteen? Return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. What does he not say? I'm done with you. It's over. I'm filing for divorce. He sits here and says, come back. Come back. Even in talking about the sin and, and judgment, God is so gracious. Sometimes people say, oh, God, in the Old Testament, there's this punishment and the lack of grace. No, God is no less gracious in the Old Testament than the New Testament. He is the same God and he has not changed. And when you re actually read the scripture, you won't find that God is more judgmental in the Old Testament. You'll find that God is exceptionally gracious. You will see sin punished. You will see consequences. You will see the, the, the results of people's decisions to walk away from the Lord and what happens there. But you will constantly hear God saying, return to me. Return to me. Arms wide open. Loving his people. Sin is spiritual adultery. That's a serious thing. It's and since sin is spiritual adultery, how do we seek forgiveness, though? Do we do it casually, flippantly? Oh, yeah. Like some people say, it's, it's, it's easier to ask forgiveness. forgiveness than permission. What are we saying? I'm going to do what I want to do, and it's no big deal. And if I get caught or someone has a problem with it, then I'll just ask for forgiveness. And we take grace lightly. Now, sometimes, we've said that, right? Some people here said that. I probably said that, too. You know, like, we're just going to go ahead and do this. But I'll tell you what. You don't want to do that with the Lord. You don't want to live your life that way. You don't want to say it's, it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. No, Lord, what do you want to do? That's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. Right? That's what I Because I want your results. I want your fruit. I want your help in my life. 
Here's the deal about sin. Sin does not make God love you any less. It does not affect his love for you, but it will affect your love for him. When we hold on to these, uh, these idols in our heart where we want to do what we want to do and we don't want to yield or surrender or, or follow him, it doesn't make him love us any less. But we will back off from loving him. And our love can grow cold. And once their love grows too cold, we're in danger of that fire burning out completely and walking away. And we see there are people who used to be passionate about Jesus, but something happened. And sometimes that thing that happened, something happened to them and they hold a bitterness in their heart. They're angry, they're upset, they were offended. And that little uh, offense was like, like, a, like a seed planted and it grows up over time. And they become critical, they start to accuse, they start to blame, and then next thing you know, the whole, everything's a problem. If you don't deal with it early, to where now I'm backing off from everybody, and especially the Lord. Oh, I'd never do that. I'd never do that, we'd say. Yeah, so did those other people. You gotta deal with these things. You gotta get it when it's just at the seed form in the heart. You gotta catch them early. Last thing I want to talk about is spiritual deafness. He mentions this about people going to the prophet and saying, and he's talking to elders here, but he says, you guys are going to the prophet to inquire of what the prophet says. Well, why are they going to the prophet to hear from God? Why can't they hear from God themselves? Because they're spiritually deaf. Because there's something on the inside of them that it has caused them to back away. And, and Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2, he says, Your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. Why am I not hearing from the Lord? Sometimes it's because there's something undealt with in the heart, unresolved, unrepented of. And we want... We want God to come through, but we, we don't want to come through. We want God to do what I say, but we don't want us to do what he says. And this is where what happens when you live in spiritual deafness for so long. You will eventually hear voices and you hear, hear answers to your prayers. This is when people, they live in a lot uh, of a state of not hearing God for so long that they have to set up their own rules according to the knowledge of good and evil that they have and what seems right for me or how I see it is. And this is the person who still has a, a, a desire to love the Lord, but then they're living in a compromised life and then they're sitting there saying, but God's okay with it. But God's okay with it. I've, I've talked to people who are living in, in a relationship where they're not married, but they're experiencing the benefits of marriage in a biblical sense. And they're sitting there saying, but we pray together. We go to church together. Or we read together. God's speaking to us. And he says it's okay. <laughs> no, he's not. It's not okay. You're deceived. Like you're not hearing from the Lord. <laughs> And, and you have deceived yourself because you've been deaf for so long that somebody's going to talk to you and tell you it's okay, but it's not Jesus. Am I right? Yeah. So we're like, I don't know. I, I think. Listen, any of us can fall into this. So if we allow things in our heart to keep us away from the presence of the Lord, the next thing you know, we're sitting here and we're, we're coming up with stories in our own head. And we're justifying our actions and we're saying it's okay. Why are why are people in, in the how do we end up having the word right in front of us and saying we believe in the God of this Bible right here? That he is speaking this and this is true. How do we end up taking this and saying, but that's not true, and that's not, and this is okay, and I know he says this, but he doesn't really mean that, even though there's no other verses that say it's okay. But this one, really, if you understood the context back then, or, you know, that was, that was old, old, a long time ago. How do we get to that point? Man, we have idols on the inside that tell us, do what you want to do. But ultimately, we end up 
reaping the consequences of that. And God is sitting here saying, oh, I'm trying to save you from falling off the edge. I'm trying to save you from falling off the edge right here. Let me deal with that idol there in your heart. Let me replace that. Put me at the center of your life. Return to me. Return to me. What is God after? Verse 5, he said, that I may seize the house of Israel by their heart. God is after our heart. Never use the excuse, God knows my heart. God knows your heart, and that's scary. Because it's not as good as you think, typically. Sometimes our hearts, we have all kinds of stuff going on in our hearts. God knows our heart, but he wants our heart. He wants our heart. He's after our heart. And when it comes to experiencing his presence, this is where he says, I've got to be at the center there. We've got to tear down those idols that would lead you into making room for the flesh. Idols, if you are anticipating the, the joy of sin, the, the fruit of that, that there's an idol on the inside that's leading you to believe that it's going to be good. If you are sitting here and you are, you are sacrificing your time with the Lord, you're sacrificing the call of God on your life for other things, there's possibly an idol there that God wants to deal with on the inside. If you're struggling with hearing from the Lord and you just can't get into a place where I hear from God, I, I open up the word and I just, nothing, nothing ever speaks to me, there may be something he's wanting to do in our hearts this morning right here because God doesn't want you in that situation at all and this isn't a thing of oh feel bad about yourself or feel, you know who you are or any heavy weight on you it's actually the Lord saying these are some things that I want to remove the weight off your shoulders from these are things I dealt with at the cross these are things that I dealt with when, when I said it is finished when I went and took your place in all the uh, judgment, all the condemnation, I carried all that. I took your place for it so that I could be your God and you would be my people. The same thing that we said from the very beginning, God's heart from the very beginning said he would be our God and we'd be his people. Amen. And so this morning I want us to just take a moment and um, bow our heads before the Lord. I want us to take a little inventory and just ask him, God, is there an idol on the inside of my heart? Is there something, an image that I have of what my life should be like, could be like, what I'm trying to build it into that is not in alignment with you? Lord, are there areas of our, our, of our lives, God, that man, we, are, we are compromising in and we're actually serving other gods through? Lord, are there areas of our lives where there's sacrifice being made and that sacrifice is ultimately, we're sacrificing you. We're putting, we're saying, I, I'm, I'm going to let go of, of you for this. Lord God, we repent right now. If something comes to your mind, even you could say it under your breath, but just before the Lord God, we repent of, of sin. We repent of our idolatry. God, we ask you to forgive us, Lord, that our hearts would be sensitive to these things, Lord, and that if there's anything that's keeping us back from you, Lord, we don't want that. We want you. Tell them, God, I want you in my life. I want to hear you. I want to listen to your voice. I want to be able to worship you freely. Lord God, I don't want to be under the bondage or burdens of, of, of sin and idolatry, Lord. God, I want to be free. So, Lord, I ask that you would forgive me by the, by the blood of Jesus and, and cleanse me. Cleanse me from this in your precious name. And, Lord, help me to reestablish my intimacy with you or to start it fresh for the first time. God, we, we say we won't serve other gods. We're, we'll serve you and you alone. In your precious name, Jesus. Amen. 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 That being said, the Lord's after our hearts. And again, not always the most upbeat message, but the turnaround when you experience freedom. And you can look back and say, honestly, this is what was going on in my life. And I was seeking the affirmation of people, and so I was 
doing all these things, but God set me free from that. Oh, I experienced rejection as a young, you know, young person, and then uh, through as a result of that, I, I kept pushing other people off. I was bitter. I was, you know, whatever it is. But the Lord, He came in and filled that that gap. He forgave me. He made me whole. I know I'm loved and accepted and wanted. It's a part of our testimony. And even as believers, sometimes we realize. I'm serving God and, and I love the Lord, but there's something in my life that I need to get free of. And I don't know if there's anybody else here who, after you gave your life to Christ, you found out there's something else you need to get free of. Am I the only one? No, I don't think so. Uh, by the show of your hands, I realize it's all of us. <laughs> and yet the Lord says, come on back, come on back, come on back. Honestly, this is what the church is. This is what the church is. It's, it's what we just read. It's people like that who God says, I'm going after you. I love you. Yep. I want you. And so it's, it, the church is not full of people who never dealt with this. Not, not our church and not any church I've ever been part of. If you ever go to a church where, oh, they didn't deal with this stuff, don't go there. You'll ruin it. You'll ruin it because they're perfect. Yes. But the reality is, and this is, these, the, these are the kind of people he calls. He invites. So there was, there was my message for today. And we want to break up into some time to talk a little bit about this. Um, if you're starving, you can grab your food at the same time because we're, we're at 12.05. But you guys didn't pray hard enough for that miracle 17 minutes. <laughs> and I've got some, pictures, some questions on the screen. In what way is sin like spiritual idolatry? Adultery, I mean, what idols do we commonly find ourselves struggling with? How does God get a hold of our hearts? Talk about any of these questions here. Let's be people who hear the word, we talk about the word, and then we apply the word as well. Amen? So we're going to take about 10 minutes. Go ahead and break up into circles, groups, tables, whatever you do. Invite somebody, that one person who always gets up and leaves. Uh, invite them to sit with you too.